Uh, good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here and I also felt completely overwhelmed after the lecture before and I said, well, my brain has to calm down in order to order its thinking because that was really an amazing uh, presentation and I do want to congratulate you. I think that it does epitomize something that in science is not necessarily automatic, which is the opportunity of doing translational sciences. And I think that what I do want to say is that all of the work that I've been able to do it's actually uh, has been possible because I, I, all throughout my career, uh, I have been very, very closely involved with chemistry. And uh, it's not just that my father is a chemist, but the recognition that biology is chemistry, chemistry to me. And in fact, one of the things that attracted me very much about studying drugs of abuse was I've always been fascinated about the brain and understanding how it works because it's so an extraordinary complex system. But drugs gives you um, the sort of by, by modifying, I mean, drugs are very good at changing the chemistry. I mean, that's what they do. They modify chemistry. And if you get selected drugs, you can then see what happens in the human brain. So you can use it as models to understand how the human brain works. And of all of the drugs, I think that the drugs of abuse, those that produce addiction to me, were the most fascinating because they actually are leading the brain to hijack itself into a mode of operation that is completely uh, goes against uh, the survival itself. And it's almost that's the whole concept about the brain becomes enslaved to a chemical. And so drugs are chemicals and they are influencing the chemistry of the brain. And the way that the, our brain responds to them is of course going to be dependent on our own chemistry, which again is influenced by genetics. So if you think about it in those ways, it is a natural, a non-brainer, that being able to take advantage of chemistry to extract the information that nature is giving it to us is a great opportunity. And that's why in terms of my, my career has been so much affected by chemistry and and it has been positive, um, I mean, one of the main tools that I've used is positron emission tomography. Because positron emission tomography allows you to measure the concentration of uh, compounds that are labeled with positron emitters. And positron emitters have short half-lives, the one that we use for this type of, of work, uh, predominantly carbon-11, 20 minutes, fluorine-18, which is uh, two hours. And the beauty of carbon-11 is you can really take a compound, a natural compound, and change one carbon for the other. Or you can take a drug and modify the comp carbon with carbon-11, and then you can use positron emission tomography to uh, directly measure the concentration of that particular compound in the living organism, and since I'm interested on the brain, I can ignore the rest of the body. But, but in the brain, it allows you to measure the concentration of compounds, their pharmacokinetics, their bioavailability. So it's extraordinarily powerful. Now for drugs of, of abuse and magic, we know from preclinical studies, and actually George Coop, who, um, who we stole from, from the scripts, actually, and we're very happy to have him at NIH, but he has been really a pioneer in demonstrating unequivocally that one of the reasons why drugs are abused and produce addiction is they have a common characteristic. They all activate the dopamine system in the brain, which then stimulates the brain reward circuitry. But the dopamine system is actually quite a complex, uh, as you may imagine, like any neurotransmitter system. And if you look at the, I like to illustrate it, uh, this is a simple sy synapse, dopamine is released, it then binds, uh, dopamine binds receptors and that produces signaling. So with positron emission tomography, you can label compounds that are relevant for the signaling to, to occur. For example, you can label the enzymes involved with dopamine system, you can label the enzymes involved with dopamine degradation, you can label the dopamine receptors, there are five receptors, you can uh, label different one of them. You can actually monitor then the activity, the response of the cell physiologically in terms of its energetics uh, when you stimulate these systems. So it gives you a tremendous specificity of, in chemistry in terms of the signals that you are looking at that as of now we don't have any other tool that we can look at. Uh, in terms of our ability to look at changes and disruption of specific chemi uh, chemi chemical compounds, proteins, uh, uh, um, uh, or in actually directly the neurotransmitters itself, or the drugs that we, that we work with. So this is where it uh, all started for many years. Studies in rodents and primates and now in humans have shown that the ability of drugs to increase dopamine in the famous nucleus accumbens, which is one of the main nodes of the reward circuitry, is fundamental for drug abuse and addiction.
Interestingly, that basically the drugs are just stimulating a system that has evolved over millions of years of evolution. It's not unique to mammals. It's actually one of the molecules that persist in very, very simple organisms, but it's a molecule that basically motivates a behavior. So if you want to motivate uh, the species to reproduce uh, itself, then you make it rewarding, and that requires dopamine. If you want to ensure that the creature eats so that it doesn't die of starvation, you make it rewarding, you liberate dopamine, and that motivates the behavior. So it's fundamental for the motivation of behaviors to engage you to do an action. Interestingly, this same system uh, is also fundamental in, in basically having you not do actions that are going to be negative. So it's one of the most flexible systems that has the largest impact in our behaviors, and drugs modify it. How do drugs modify it? How do they increase dopamine? It depends on the class of drugs, and there's a whole variety of mechanisms, but all of them have the same effect. They stimulate these dopaminergic pathways. So from animal experiments, it was very clear that that is something that is indispensable. But you come to humans and you ask this question, to what extent that is relevant, and to what extent we really can explain the rewarding effects of drugs on these dopaminergic effects. And I was very intrigued by that, and I sort of says, well, let's use positron emission tomography to try to investigate, just like they do with microdialysis here, where you measure the concentration of dopamine with a probe in the nucleus circumbens. You cannot do that. You cannot put a probe in humans. But you can do it with uh, imaging, and the way that you look at that is as follows. So here is your dopamine terminal. Actually, in, in uh, uh, the dopamine terminal, you liberate dopamine, it binds to receptors. Interestingly, this uh, dopamine is basically the, the time of interaction in the synapse is very, very short. It's removed back into the transporter, which recycles dopamine. Um, interestingly, you, uh, normally we have something like 10% or 15% of our receptors binding to dopamine. You work with a ligand that you label with C11, C11 raclopride, which binds to dopamine D2 receptors that are not occupied by dopamine. So in normal circumstances, 90%. You bring the subject back and you give them a drug. In this case, we're giving methylphenidate. Methylphenidate blocks this transporter. Why did we choose methylphenidate? Because um, it basically has very similar affinity to this transporter, the dopamine transporter, as cocaine. And in cocaine, we knew that the ability, the, the reason why people have used cocaine and why it's rewarding and addictive is because it blocks the dopamine transporter. And methylphenidate does the same thing, except this is a drug that we use extensively in children for tr the treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I was, it's very difficult uh, ethically to justify giving cocaine to a person that's not addicted to it, whereas we could give methylphenidate. And we, we've used this strategy for many, many, many studies. I'm just going to be uh, speaking to you about those that are relevant. And in the concept is that when we use methylphenidate, you block the transporter, dopamine accumulates, it cannot recycle back. You occupy the receptors, raclopride binding goes down. And after you do appropriate mathematical modeling to account for non-specific binding and radio tracer delivery, you can actually uh, quantify the relative changes in dopamine by uh, comparing this with your placebo. And when you do that, and you're doing it in normal people that are awake, and you're giving them IV methylphenidate, and people get high with IV methylphenidate. In fact, cocaine abusers don't, don't, cannot differentiate it from IV cocaine. And when you do that, you can then measure a biochemical parameter, which is the, ch the relative change in dopamine, which is what we have here, versus so the subjective perception that the individual has of reward or high. And what we showed, for example, was we injected intravenous methylphenidate. One minute later, we injected raclopride. Dopamine is occupying those receptors. It doesn't bind. And we can see the percent change in your specific binding. And was two things very interesting, and I, I was actually very intrigued about the comment of Peter that says biologists get away with a lot of putting things together. But the thing with, with biology is diversity. I mean, and that's where uh, sometimes mixing things may be relevant because you have such a diverse set of parameters that it's very difficult sometimes to specifically control it. So look at the diversity in terms of the magnitude of the changes of dopamine that you are producing by the, basically the same dose of a drug. And, and it's not related to differences in metabolism in plasma because we were controlling for that. But bottom line is what we showed in this intravenous methylphenidate was the larger the changes in dopamine, the more intense the high. Indeed, documenting that in humans, the increases in dopamine produced by, by intravenous methylphenidate were associated with reward. 
But at this, I create a, a lot of disturbance in the psychiatry community. I'm a psychiatrist because I actually um, uh, that was showing that methylphenidate was able to increase dopamine, produce very intense high, and yet the psychiatrists are giving this drug to children. So they were saying, Nora, I mean, you cannot be implying that we're giving a drug just like cocaine to children for the treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorders. But as, as, as we think about these processes, we tend to think about magnitudes, but we don't tend to think about dynamics. And yet in biological system, this biological system signal, not just in terms of magnitude, but the rate of change of those signaling systems. And I was very intrigued about it because first of all, uh, this is intravenous methylphenidate and we don't use intravenous methylphenidate to treat children with ADHD. We do oral methylphenidate. And an oral methylphenidate, um, I mean, the, all, all the psychiatrists and many pharmacologists were saying, oh, don't worry about it. Um, the reason why it's not addictive, it's not addictive because it's rapidly metabolized into ritalinic acid, which is correct. And they say, well, ritalinic acids are very poor at, bl at, at blocking these dopamine transporters. Well, what we found, therefore, they said, when you give oral methylphenidate, it's metabolized, you are not blocking transporters, you are not increasing dopamine. So we did the experiment and said, okay, let's give oral methylphenidate, let's wait 60 minutes and let's measure the raclopride binding. And to our surprise, actually, it is a very potent uh, stimulant. And whether it is being metabolized into ritalinic acid or not, the bottom line is we're changing dopamine significantly. But what was very interesting is we're not producing a high. And again, highlighting the notion that the dynamics is actually what's driving the difference between this and this. This is done one minute before we injected raclopride. This is done 60 minutes before we injected raclopride. And we needed to do 60 minutes because when you get that drug orally, it takes 60 minutes to two hours to reach peak concentrations in brain. And actually, you can look at that here. We did PET studies. You can label, we label C methylphenidate with C11, C11, and then we gave it intravenously, and then we measured this is a time activity curve. You measure the concentration in brain, it goes very fast, and then it slowly goes out of it, relatively slowly. Uh, when you give it orally, you see it takes a long time. And I was very intrigued about it, and I knew, I mean, of course I knew that the rate dependency at which the drugs get into the brain was important for reward. And I knew it because in the 80s, this guy, um, Jules, actually, and uh, Balster had done an experiment where they varied the, the injection speed of cocaine into animals, and that they showed that if they injected the the, the cocaine very slowly, it was equivalent of significantly decreasing the dose. So it significantly reduced the addictive effects of drugs, of, of cocaine in this case. And I was also, it was also evident because we knew clinically that the route of administration of a drug determines its rewarding effects. So when you inject, when you smoke, which leads to the fastest uptake into the brain, the drugs are much more addictive and dangerous than when you actually take them orally. And it goes beyond bioavailability and metabolism. The speed at which they get into the brain is an important variable in terms of reward. And I was obsessed about it, and I was, you know, when you're obsessed, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was trying to understand why. Why is the right dependency important in the dopamine system? And I am very embarrassed to confess to you all that it took me several years to, to, to basically come up with the obvious. It was, it was very, very obvious about why this was relevant. And one day it just became, I mean, just like you, the, the, the thought was there and said, how, how stupid have I been? Why have I not seen it? And again, it comes back to looking at nature for the explanation, and the explanation was on nature. Why, what do I mean? Dopamine cells in the midbrain that go into the, that send their projections to the nucleus accumbens where they liberate dopamine, uh, basically fire in two modes. They either fire very slowly, relatively slowly, which we call a tonic dopamine firing, which is between the really one to 10 or five to 10 hertz, or they fire very, very rapidly, which it can be 15 to 30 or sometimes up to 50 hertz. When they fire very rapidly, dopamine goes up very, very abruptly. It's, these are bursts, so it's very short lasting. But when that happens, the dopamine signal signals, that's the way that the dopamine system signals saliency. So normally we all have tonic dopamine firing and that actually is liberating relatively um, stable levels of dopamine that keeps us engaged, that motivates you, that keeps our attention in, 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 in what we are thinking or what we are doing. But if there's something unexpected happening that you don't, that is or very rewarding or very aversive or very novel, 
then the, you have this spiking of dopamine cells that shoots dopamine up and that stimulates dopamine D1 receptors. So the puzzle was the fact that we were saying, okay, it activates, increases dopamine, dopamine activates the reward system, but there are five receptors and those five receptors have different properties. Two of them are particularly relevant uh, for many reasons and have been the most investigated, dopamine D1 and dopamine D2 receptors. But in all of these machinations that we were speaking about, the rewarding effects, we didn't consider the distinction between D1 and D2. D1 receptors have very low affinity for dopamine. So they will be stimulated only when you have these phasic dopamine cell firing patterns. Dopamine D2 receptors, on the other hand, are very high affinity and they get stimulated by tonic dopamine and by phasic dopamine. And these D1 and D2 receptors have opposite effects on drug reward. If you actually remove you knock out genetically or pharmacologically, whichever way you want, the D2 receptors, drugs continue to be rewarding. On the other hand, if you knock out D1 receptors, you, pro you profoundly influence, the, uh, the decrease the rewarding effects of drugs. So what became very obvious, the reason why the rate dependence is important is for drugs to be rewarding, they have to emulate what you are producing into phasic dopamine cell signaling and that is derived from the stimulation of the D1 system. And in fact, these are, are two studies that we did actually in, in optical imaging technologies. We can take these findings from, the, from clinical studies and try to understand them in the cellular systems. So with this uh, green, green fluorescent protein that, we were, that, that was, Peter was discussing, we can actually differently label cells that express D1 versus D2 receptors in the famous nucleus accumbens. And then using calcium imaging and optical imaging, we can then monitor the responses of cells that contain D1 versus cells that contain D2 when we give them cocaine. These are cells that contain D1, you activate them and you activate them very, very rapidly. These are cells that contain D2, you inhibit them. So the responses are in opposite patterns and this in turn appears to have, based on animal models, an opposite effect in drug reward. D1 signaling, stimulating reward, D2 signaling, actually interfering with the rewarding effects of drugs. So the reason really why it is important, the drugs are doing is they are generating a very strong signaling through the DY system um, that is very fast. On the other hand, uh, the signaling through the D2 system is longer lasting, but it's slower. And that balance between D1 and D2 is ultimately what determines the temporal changes, the very fast high that you get when you get that drug and how it slowly decreases. So of course this is, uh, I mean, with, with related to reward, understanding why drugs are rewarding, but the question is very far from understanding why are they addictive. And why is it that any one of us, if we were to take a drug and we're not addicted, we would feel reward and we will produce these dopaminergic changes. But only those people that are addicted, in those people that drug, the moment that they take it, and even if it's a tiny concentration, they would immediately crave more drug. And that, that that the trying of the drug will trigger what we call a pinch, which is more and more and more. So what is the distinction? Why is it that in a normal person that's not addicted versus a person that's addicted, you get the same drug, such a different effect? And that's what I basically, I've been obsessed all my life. And, and, and where do you start? Obviously the brain is the most complex system of all, but we do know that the dopamine system is fundamental in drugs. We know it's fundamental in motivation. So it's, it makes obvious sense to start looking at whether there are changes in the dopaminergic pathways when people become addicted. And one of the simple ones, uh, based on what we knew from studies that have been done for years, understanding the effects of antipsychotic drugs that block the dopamine D2 receptors and the consequences of that blockade, we didn't know from preclinical, actually, and even clinical studies, that the dopamine system, when you block it, the dopamine D2 receptors, they upregulate. So one of the questions was, if you are stimulating with dopamine excessively, can you do exactly the opposite to what uh, antipsychotics do, do? Do you produce a downregulation of the dopamine D2 receptors as a function of the constant abnormal stimulation by drugs? And this is cocaine, but basically all of the drugs do the same phenomenon of increasing dopamine, albeit at different magnitudes. <clears throat> 
and with different pharmacokinetics, by the way. And so the, uh, we asked that question, is there evidence that there are changes in the dopamine system in people that are addicted to drugs? And we did indeed find, and this is actually the, a slide that was seen in that uh, very, very funny uh, video, actually wonderful video, of introduction that we've been looking at and others have been looking up in, 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 in humans and in non-human primates and in rodents. And this is a very consistent reproducible find. These are normal controls for different types of drugs. It's also not specific for one drug. You actually see it for a wide variety of drugs. There is a decrease in the availability of dopamine D2 receptors. And, and this is, um, again, I want to, to uh, emphasize that we, we in biology have uh, diversity, and diversity can be problematic because it actually is very, uh, very challenging, but it also provides extraordinary answers. So here are two groups of cocaine abusers uh, studied with C11 raclopride uh, here, and this is another PET ligand for dopamine D2 receptors, fluorinating and methylspiroperidol. Uh, and what you see here is the different m mathematical modeling parameters that we use to measure dopamine D2 receptor availability. And you have to vary dependent, depending on the characteristics of your ligand. But uh, bottom line is that for practical purposes, you can see basically the same results. In normal controls, um, the, in purple and in cocaine abusers in green, in both of them, the expression of dopamine D2 receptors decreases as, as we grow older. And that's a... I think that we can come back if you want, but, but it is a very, again, post-mortem studies replicated across multiple systems. We know they, the expression goes down, unfortunately, but it goes down. That's it. That's life. The, the, um, when you look at group uh, comparisons, you can see that cocaine abusers have significantly lower levels of dopamine D2 receptors, and we know now that it's levels. We call it availability because it's a PET measurement. The lower availability of dopamine D2 receptors, but, but if you also look at it, there is overlap. And to me, that has been a fascinating concept. There's overlap, there are normals that look like cocaine abusers, and cocaine abusers that look not normal controls. The same thing with alcoholics, methamphetamine abusers, and heroin abusers. So what does it tell me? From, from a perspective of how you look at data obtained in humans, with imaging, well, you say, well, it looks like dopamine D2 receptors are playing an important role in the vulnerability of addiction. If you have low levels of, of dopamine D2 receptors, it appears that is making you vulnerable. Or you can sort of say, perhaps it is that if you have high levels, that's protecting you. And that's why you can have individuals that have normal, that have low levels, because it doesn't mean dopamine D2 receptors low does not mean addiction. It means a factor that may be making you vulnerable. But that's just an hypothesis. So how do you causally t test, test the causality, the mechanistic association? So you take these studies from, from humans, you take them into animals, or you can have actually multiple animals models for addiction. And again, again, George Coop has opened up the whole field in terms of developing models that have the validity to actually uh, enable to predict behavior in humans and responses to medications. So using those animal models, we can make animals addicted to alcohol, which is here, but we've done the same uh, experiment for cocaine uh, for cocaine administration in animals. You can use different uh, breeds of rats. We work with rats that, that have different vulnerability for addiction because you can actually breed the animals that will take a lot of drugs and you can breed animals that don't take any drugs. For example, uh, alcohol-preferring rats love to take alcohol. Alcohol-non-preferring rats don't take alcohol. So you can then see, depending on your background, whether if you increase dopamine D2 receptors, if you are saying that that's a vulnerability factor, if you over overcome it by injecting a gene that, ex that contains the, that, the gene of the D2 receptors and stereotactically inserting it into the famous nucleus accumbens, uh, can, you pro can you change the behavior? And these were studies that we did many years ago, and then we replicated in these alcohol-preferring, non-preferring. We've also replicated in cocaine, uh, in the cocaine models, and the results are basically the same. You in stereotactically inject the gene, you overexpress D2 receptors, and uh, with an adenovirus, the expression in, is uh, short-lasting, and by 10 days, it's back to baseline. You look at the behavior in alcohol intake, and you can see this is decreases, a dramatic reduction in, the, um, in alcohol intake when you have the maximal expression of the increases in the expression of D2 receptors. It goes rapidly back to baseline in this animal model as the receptors go back to where they were. 
The same thing when you overexpress in alcohol preferring rats, and these are rats that are genetically bred to like alcohol, you again significantly reduce the amount of alcohol they are drinking. And if you look at the data and says, well, what is it telling us? We're not curing, we're not curing. It's not like we're getting the animal to stop drinking altogether. What we're doing is reducing the amount of alcohol it's taking. And if you think about what is alcoholism, alcoholism is the compulsive quant uh, consumption of high quantities of alcohol. So we're disrupting it by one single protein. And when I think about it, you sort of says, I mean, it's actually in my brain hurts because you think about the brain and these behaviors being so complex. It says one single protein can profoundly modify the behavior that creates havoc. So how, the, I mean, it would be wonderful if we could increase the D2 receptors and because I think that this would be one mechanism where you could actually protect individuals from consumption of high quantities of drugs. And, and this is our data, but other investigators using different m models for genetic manipulation of enhancing, when you enhance the function of the dopamine D2 receptor, either to its transduction mechanisms or by increasing, you consistently decrease the rewarding effects of drugs. Interestingly, if you do the, op if you do the same thing with the D1 receptors, you do exactly the opposite. You enhance the rewarding effects of the drugs. So my question is why? How can a single protein have such a profound effect on behavior? So again, look at nature and try to extract the answers for, I learned it very rapidly with this uh, rate dependency by understanding the phasic and the tonic dopamine was so obvious. So, okay, so this time I say, okay, well, why? And, and I sort of say, well, you know, we are looking at decreases in dopamine D2 receptors, but the important question is how does that affect the brain function? Because if I have one protein up and down and it doesn't affect function, then who cares? And so in all of our studies, consistently over these past 20 years, we've been measuring not just probes for dopamine, but also probes that uh, indicate brain function. And the, the marker that we're using for brain function is deoxyglucose, because it's um, basically its uptake is um, the, the glucose, the deoxyglucose is trapped in the cell when it's phosphorylated and it, repair, it reflects directly the, active, the needs for energetics of the cell. And so when the brain is very active, it consumes a lot of uh, glucose. And if you are doing a deoxyglucose studies, you see increased uptake. Interestingly, in a wide variety of brain diseases, um, you can actually very, very early on document the areas of the brain that are not functioning properly because you can see a decrease in the utilization of energy. And very, very sensitive indicators. So, for example, it can predict Alzheimer's because before the symptoms emerge. It can predict Huntington Korea before actually the symptoms emerge. So it's a very sensitive indicator. In epilepsy, you can locate this, the area of abnormality. So we've been doing it, and so we measure D2 receptors. We measure brain glucose metabolism in the same subjects. So let's look at uh, nature. What does nature, and these pathways have been very, very nicely uh, illuminated by work that initiated on Parkinson's disease for the motor system. That D1 system, which is called the Dirac system, that has a different type of connection from the D2 receptor system, which is the one that I'm discussing here, which is the indirect pathway. The D2 receptor cells reside in the striatum where the nucleus accumbens are located, and D2 receptors, when they are stimulated by dopamine, they inhibit them. But these cells are GABAergic, that is, they are inhibitory. So when dopamine inhibits, a, a, when, when dopamine inhibits an inhibitory cell, it, of course, disin, inhibit, disinhibits it. But if you don't have um, D2 receptors, you cannot disinhibit these cells, so there is an increase in inhibition. And these cells project to the globus pallidus externus, which is another one that is a GABAergic inhibitory cell. So if you are increasing inhibition of uh, an inhibitory, what happens? You decrease that inhibition. And these cells project to the subthalamic nucleus, which is an excitatory. So you, since you are decreasing subthalamic nucleus, that, and it's excitatory, that, that signal is amplified. And that goes to the globus pallidus internus, which is n uh, an inhibitory. So you are stimulating an inhibitory, what happens? You in enhance the inhibition, which actually goes to the thalamus. The thalamus is stimulatory, you are enhancing inhibition, what's happened? This decreases the stimulation of the frontal cortex. So if you follow this whole story, you would say low levels of dopamine D2 receptors in a baseline state should result in decreased activity of the frontal cortex. And long and behold, if you study drug abusers of any type, 
uh, when they are on, the, on withdrawal, you see reductions in um, activity in the frontal cortex. But the question is not that they are decreased, are these two linked? And you can look at that, and we've looked at that because we've been doing these toys in parallel, and whether it is cocaine abusers, methamphetamine abusers, or alcoholics, the lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the lower the metabolic activity of the frontal cortical areas. And it was very intriguing because, again, letting, letting the data speak to you, because we, we didn't know very much at all about what drugs were doing to the brain, the area where this relationship is the strongest, actually the frontal cortex is gigantic. We have these gigantic frontal cortices. But there are two areas that are predominantly where you see this relationship. The, orbit, the famous orbital frontal cortex here on top of our eyes and the anterior single edge arrows, uh, which actually this, this is wrong. This is the visual cortex. This is the anterior single edge arrows. So the, these two areas, orbital frontal cortex, and you know, again, I'm just showing you how my brain, when I, when I saw the orbital frontal cortex, I said, my God, my God, why the orbital frontal cortex? That's the area of the brain that's abnormal in patients with obsessive compulsive disorder. And so is the anterior single edge arrows. That's the area that's abnormal in, a, in patients with, with, um, with obsessive compulsive disorders. And then it just hit me again. I was speaking one day and I was sort of saying, you know, this is what we find. And then it hit me, what is characteristic about the process of drug addiction? The patient will tell you, doc, I don't know why I'm taking the drugs. I just cannot stop it. And then as you sort of think about the patients that have obsessive compulsive disorders, that you say, well, why? Uh, they say, you know, I know my hands are clean. I just cannot stop washing, washing them. I have to wash them and wash. I just cannot stop. And so if you start to say to us, well, what does these two things have in common? And it's the compulsive quality of the behavior. And I think that that's now, we know you damage, this, you damage these areas. If these areas are not functioning, you actually, your behavior becomes very inflexible. Your behavior becomes repetitive, you perseverate, you cannot change as a function of the demands of the environment. And that's exactly typical what happens in the person that's addicted. They are taking the drug, even though the drug itself, by when they are consuming it, is not any more rewarding, even by their own expression. It almost becomes like, again, an automatic behavior. And this is uh, just, just in terms of replication, because one of the things that was important was, is this, is this relationship, is this regulation of the D2 receptor indirect pathway of the orbital frontal cortex, something that's unique to people that are addicted or not? And so we did these studies in people that were not addicted to alcohol, who actually have a father who was an alcoholic and another second degree regulative who was an alcoholic and did exactly the same measurements. And I'm showing you the data differently here because this is an MRI and in colors you are seeing the areas of the brain where the levels of dopamine D2 receptors in the striatum are correlated with metabolic activity. And, and it's striking, it's incredibly striking that you have such a level of specificity. It is the prefrontal circuitry where you see this correlation, the orbital frontal cortex, the single edge arrows, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Interestingly, this allows us also to identify the anterior, the anterior insula in, in its uh, boundary with the prefrontal cortex. The lower the receptors, the lower the metabolism. The higher the receptors, the higher the metabolism. Again, indicating that your baseline dopamine detour, the expression of this protein in your brain, actually modulates the level of activity of the prefrontal areas of our, our brain that enables us very importantly to uh, perform, to have that flexibility of changing our behavior, to analyze a situation and determine when there's an error such that we can change it. Of course, extraordinarily important for decision making, but it's also an important area of the brain that signals also whether something is rewarding or salient or not. And so uh, very important for everyday activities. Every single day, we are exposed to things that are rewarding for many reasons, and depending on the state of our brains and our needs, we may choose to go or not. So we have to balance all of this information that's coming from multiple circuits. The reward system is fundamental. It drives our motivation for one thing versus the other. The amygdala, which actually, again, very highly investigated by, by George Coop, which actually becomes disrupted in addiction, um, determines the emotional component on it and the hippocampus, but they also store memories that are not just the classical memory, but also the conditioned responses. And all of those influencing the signaling into the reward system that motivates and drives behavior. So you are exposed to something rewarding. You say, um, oh, I want to do this, but your frontal cortex says, no, it's not a good idea. And this pathway can inhibit both 
this uh, nucleus and it can also in inhibit the amygdala. But in a person who's addicted, where this duty receptor system is resulting in an abnormally impaired function of this prefrontal cortical circuitry, and where through the uh, stimulation of the amygdala that uh, encodes these condition responses, and I didn't have time to go into it, but that's another aspect of the circuitry disrupted by drugs, uh, hyperstimulates this with condition cues to drive the behavior, the prefrontal cortex cannot inhibit these prepotent responses. And this is really at the essence about why a person that's addicted, if they get exposed to the drug, really, they cannot stop it. Because the prefrontal cortex basically um, gets disconnected. And this is the only way by which you can modulate these very, very strong urges and drives to do something. And our, our biology has been generated to create situations where the prefrontal cortex cannot stop it. And this is actually very important for survival, but when you engage it into a mechanism that's not adequate, can create havoc as it occurs with addiction. Now, this is one of the stories in terms of, of addiction, and it's important because obviously it has given us a perspective about how to intervene in order to uh, help buffer some of this damage. And so therapeutically, whether you develop medications that can strengthen prefrontal control or inhibit um, amygdala and strong Q reactivity or actually enhance rewarding effects of non-drugs while decreasing the value of the drug, whichever, or you do a behavioral intervention, the bottom line is you want to create a system that's much better balanced. That's one. But drugs are more than just dopamine directly influenced by the drug itself. And what happens with, when we're dealing with drug abusers is that they are getting these chemicals into their bodies and their bodies are going through a lot of physiological systems. And in many instances, they are not just one drug, but they are mixtures of drugs. And this is very important, and I want to illustrate it here with, with tobacco and smoking tobacco. And I, again, reiterate, and I'm glad that Kim Jan that said that, I mean, going to a not legalization of our, a third drug, marijuana, will be actually going to create havoc. Why? Because the drugs that in our society create the greatest cost in terms of mortality by far are the legal drugs. And it's not because they are more dangerous or more addictive, but because they are legal making them available. So nicotine, for example, is a major problem, and we do know uh, when you take tobacco. But when you take tobacco, you are actually ingesting um, more than 4,000 chemicals, and some of them have active effects, and some of them are actually relevant in terms of the toxicity of the tobacco we know from cancer, but also in terms of its rewarding effects. And our group, actually, at Brookhaven National Laboratory, very much led uh, in, this, in this effort by Dr. Joanna Fowler, who's a remarkable chemist, had been very intrigued by studies that have shown in, uh, in rats that the, the smoke of cigarette inhibit monoamine oxidase. Monoamine oxidases in the brain are very important because they are metabolizing dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, the catecholamines, and all of them play fundamental roles in mood, in addiction, and on a wide variety of diseases. And in fact, uh, these are targets for treatments against Parkinson's disease and also as an antidepressants. So we were interested to know if people that smoke cigarettes would be influencing this enzyme, monoamine oxidase. Again, this is not an effect of nicotine, and we did all of the experiments to prove it. It's an effect of apparently Harman, which is one of the chemicals in the smoke. And, and again, this was not a, a, a small effect, it was a huge effect. This is a monoamine oxidase B, which we could label by, uh, measure by labeling depre deprenil with carbon E level. This is a concentration of Mao, Mao B, high levels in the thalamus, high levels in the striatum. This is a smoker. A, a very profound reduction in the concentration of this enzyme. Um, the, the inhibition of the enzyme is irreversible. So if you stop smoking, it will take something like two or three months for the enzyme to recover. And, uh, and it's not uh, an effect of uh, initially people thought it was genetic. That's why they have low levels of monoamine oxidase B and that's why you're smoking. Well, no, 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 no. If you stop smoking, these are two years after non-smoking anything, you can see the recovery. So this is the individual data. And I want to show you individual data because I think biology is diversity and I love diversity and I think that it actually, uh, we have to look at it in the face. Otherwise, we don't get reproducible results or anything and we don't really understand phenomena. 
But these are the smokers, and you can see a significant blockade. There's no overlap. It's very rare, in fact, with these imaging studies that we've done. I don't think that we've ever seen uh, a comparison where we see no overlap. It's actually quite profound. Now, when you look at it and you ask the question, monoamine oxidase B degrades dopamine. So if you actually inhibit it, you will have more dopamine. So wouldn't that be one of the reasons why smokers are smoking cigarettes? And indeed, after these studies came around, the clinical studies have shown that indeed the combination of nicotine replacement therapies with uh, drugs that inhibit monoamine oxidase A actually improves efficacy and leads to better outcomes. So this in and of itself, inhibition of the enzyme, we could use this as a therapeutic to try to basically help the patient stop smoking. With respect to the toxicity, though, the other side of it is if you, you, and you saw this image because it was shown in the video, it's a very striking effect. And this is for monoamine oxidase B, but by the way, uh, we also see the same effect for the other enzyme, monoamine oxidase A. This is the whole body uh, of a normal person. This is the whole body of a normal person that smokes. And you can see nothing in the brain, in this one here. And basically here you see the, the, the shadows of the, of the lung. Lungs are difficult to image because they are very thin and your spatial resolution is low, but you can see it. There's nothing. They basically go almost completely block the concentration of the enzyme in the lungs, in the kidneys, and uh, you also see the decreases in the liver. And this enzyme in the body is actually not per se degrading in catecholamines, but it's a very important enzyme for the degradation of a wide variety of toxins. And the same thing with monoamine oxidase A. And in fact, when you, you inhibit monoamine oxidase A, with, like with uh, the, uh, some of the antidepressants, this could be very dangerous because you could uh, trigger a tyramine response from the lack of uh, degradation of these byproducts and patients could die. But it also serves, so, so the question is that you are thinking about the negative effects of smoke, you can actually start to understand it's very likely that this is having a, also contributing not just to things like we know with cancer, but making, explaining some of the toxicity and the negative effects that tobacco have that are not just necessarily related to cancer per se, but to increasing the, the vulnerability of multiple organs for pathology. It's also, um, again, the chemistry, I mean, you, and, 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 and just, just how beautiful. One of the big challenges that we have in medicine is that we have very little information of delivery of drugs into the fetal brain. So when we have a, a woman that's pregnant, for example, and you have a woman that is a smoker, one of the things that people do is nicotine replacement therapy for that woman. Well, the, I mean, I've always been obsessed because about this whole concept because we do know that nicotine during pregnancy is quite deleterious and it increases the likelihood of very adverse outcomes for the, for the fetus. And very frequently, I mean, it's one of the main causes, if not the main cause, for prematurity in, in humans. And, and we were very intrigued about the notion of then using this technology to understand the kinetics of nicotine because there's no real good way of looking at it. We cannot do this in humans because we cannot inject radioactivity into a woman that's pregnant, but we can do it in non-human pri uh, primates. And we've done it for acetylene cocaine, with FDG, with nicotine. And nicotine is uh, notable because you can see the high, high uptake of nicotine in the, the mother, uh, in her brain. And this is the little baby, and this is her brain, or his brain, I don't know what it is. But, but you can see that, that the nicotine is going binding into the placenta, which actually produces vasoconstriction, which is one of the mechanisms by which you have such adverse effects of smoking during pregnancy. Very high uptake into the fetal liver, so you know that nicotine is basically getting into, into the fetus. And you also see in the brain, much lower than in the mother. But the kinetics, which are the clear colors, are much lower. So even though the concentration is much lower in uptake, its clearance is worse. Uh, so, so that actually identifying a very powerful tool to understand how drugs ultimately can get into the, into the brain and by using, for example, if we had used the nicotine receptor that binds nicotine, all of them seem to bind very nicely, but the alpha-4 beta-2, which is the one that is associated with reward, we could have actually been able to document if, in fact, this is, is, is level of occupancy. So it's a powerful tool, uh, and again, illustrating how we can use it to just uh, look at problems that are of public health policy. This is not our study. This is a, a study done by the group at UCLA that used the alpha-4 beta-2 uh, PET ligand to document, these are nicotine alpha-4 beta-2 receptors, what are their occupancy when, they are, when the subjects are exposed to secondhand smoke. So this is not that they are smoking, they are in a room where other people are smoking. 
and again, identifying a significant, uh, significant occupancy of uh, those receptors by secondhand smoke. Uh, very clearly and unequivocally answer the question, yes, indeed, secondhand smoke is, is harmful and it can result in the activation of the system. Now, we don't know what the neuroplastic changes are or what may be the consequences in terms of uh, vulnerability for addictiveness or other consequences of withdrawal from nicotine in the secondhand smoke, but we can clearly state objectively that secondhand smoke is the liver. Now, and as we go forward, and again, bringing forward the, the, to me, this is a chemistry alive in the brain, uh, how it can solve, uh, help us solve some of the most challenging problems that we have in terms of the whole area of life sciences, uh, which has been revolutionized by the advent of genetics and our opportunity to understand how genetics influence brain diseases and uh, complex psychiatric diseases. And some of the things that we don't can call disease per se, but basically are very problematic and, and perhaps what is it a disease, but one of the most challenging that, that we have as a society is aggression. And so there's been a lot of interest to try to understand are the genes that predict the aggressive behavior. And one of the most consistent findings is this gene, the monoamine oxidase A, that we were discussing before that is involved with the metabolism of catecholamines. And it has been shown, actually, that indeed this, uh, and, and, and if you, there was a knockout family that didn't have the monoamine oxidase A, and that family was characterized by um, a group of individuals that spent all their life in jail. And they, they were males. And interestingly, because this is encoded in the X chromosome, so if you are a male and you don't have it, you are a knockout. Whereas females, you have two Xs. And, but then there is a polymorphism that is associated supposedly in animal models and in cells with low expression of monoamine oxidase A that gives you a higher vulnerability for aggression. And again, this has been replicated by multiple investigators. And a polymorphism that leads to high concentration. But it's an interesting phenomena because if you have this uh, low that predisposes you to aggression, you will only develop aggression if you have an environmental insult if you actually have severe maltreatment as a child or very deprived. If you don't have that, it doesn't make a difference. So, so again, illustrating that the, the relationship between the gene was not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but everybody was the sense that, okay, low monoamine oxidase A, that means low concentration of the enzyme. So again, we're using positron emission tomography. We're using chlorgelin, C11 chlorgelin as the PET ligand. We can measure the concentration of monoamine oxidase A. And these are 26 subjects that have the polymorphism that supposedly leads to high concentration. And these are the 12 subjects that is the rare variant that have a polymorphism that leads to low concentration. And you can see there's absolutely no difference in the expression of the protein in brain. So here you have a very interesting concept, the whole hypothesis that this was driving your aggressive behavior because you have low concentration is not correct. Interestingly, if you then, instead of looking at the association between the concentration of the enzyme and the gene, say, does the concentration of the enzyme itself in the brain in any way associated with aggression? And when we did that, we saw that indeed it was that basically the individuals that had high levels have very low levels of aggression versus those that have very low levels do have much more aggressive behavior. But this in the adult brain was not determined by the, 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 this genetic polymorphism. Interestingly, in trying to understand what it was, why is it that we are seeing these differences again in the concentration of monoamine A? What is determining this variability? What we came to basically uh, show some evidence, though it's preliminary because the evidence was this is brain, and our evidence came out of peripheral blood in terms of epigenetic modifications to the gene seem to be accounting, maybe accounting for these differences in concentration on monoamine oxidase A in levels. So what we did was we measured the level of methylation of the DNA, uh, of the DNA promoter for the monoamine oxidase A gene, and we observed that indeed, the greater the level of uh, methylation of the promoter, the lower the concentration of the enzyme. Again, and I think it's a very nice example about how we cannot be making these simple inferences about this polymorphism, therefore, that is actually driving the aggressive behavior.
What it's telling me in my brain, because the data is quite strongly, is, and again, uh, very nicely illustrated, the human brain, one of the, the most amazing things about the human brain, are dip, uh, different from any other organ, is the organ in our brain that takes the longer to develop more than 20 years to fully develop. And there are these windows on w under which certain genes exert different effects. So it is very likely that when the effects of the monoamine oxidase A genotype are derived by an influence on the brain development, as opposed to an effect that is determining the concentration of the enzyme as an adult. That as an adult, the concentration of the protein in your brain is determined by a quite variety of factors that basically are determining whether you express that gene or not. And we know that one of those factors is, of course, cigarette smoking that inhibits the expression of uh, this gene. So this is an example about how you can use these type of tools to understand the biochemistry. Another beautiful example, um, opioid. Opioid addiction right now it has become the most problematic uh, problem, uh, issue in, in addiction that we've seen in years. Close to 30,000 people are dying annually from overdoses of opioids. We, we actually know that there is a, the, the gene, there is a, a target for heroin, there's a target for all of the prescription opioids that's driving the use of this drug, is a mu opioid receptor. And there is a, a polymorphism in this uh, mu opioid receptor that has been associated with influencing the binding of, uh, the, two, of the endogenous opioids to the mu opioid receptor. And this polymorphism is basically a rare allele, which in you will introduce a G instead of an A. And this, this uh, variant is associated with a higher vulnerability for alcohol, for heroin, but also it predicts a better therapeutic response to naltrexone as a treatment for alcoholism. And in this case, using genetics, actually, and uh, in coupled with binding experiments using a ligand that binds for mu myopioid receptors, investigators, and this is actually uh, has been, again, replicated by at least three different groups, have shown that the G polymorphism, which is the risk allele, actually, whether you're an alcohol or, an, uh, 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 or a control, is associated with a lower levels of expression of myopioid receptors. And in, ter and, and in turn, it also, these mu, mu opioid receptors are modulating dopamine cells. And when you look at it in terms of alcoholics, uh, alcoholics who in, in whom this polymorphism puts you at greater risk, actually, of alcoholism than this one, you can actually, and then you apply it to understand the changes in dopamine produced by alcohol, Something fascinating was revealed by this particular study done at the NIH that only in those individuals that have the G allele, only in those individuals did alcohol increase dopamine. In the other ones, it did not. And can give us an insight about why this particular polymorphism in the mu opioid receptor may be actually modulating the vulnerability of alcoholism. And in this case, we have an example where that polymorphism directly uh, influences the expression of the protein. I, I don't want to go into more examples, just I wanted just to give these ones because in my brain, they really epitomize that tremendous power of chemistry into illuminating processes that are extraordinarily complex, such as how the brain works. But very importantly, how um, diseases affect signaling in our brains, how they affect our chemistry, and how we can use that knowledge, of course, to actually develop interventions that can help rebalance it back. This is my team. I mean, actually, uh, Joanna Fowler, who actually uh, wa is basically was the leader of the, of the group. She is a chemist, and we, I've always been surrounded by chemists, many chemists. This is Sonny Kim, who is actually uh, came with me to the, to the NIH. But this uh, work would have not been possible without uh, that whole knowledge and the ability of the chemists to m just to modify molecules and, and quantify their consequences into biological living systems. And again, I want to thank you for your attention, and um, thanks very much.